Hi class, and welcome to chapter seven of retail. Uh, this, this chapter covers the actual market locations. How do we select them? And so we're gonna be looking at real brick and mortar type situations in this chapter. So without further ado, let's look at some of the main points that you're gonna learn in the chapter. The first is that there's a lot of variables that you have to decide on when it comes to trying to choose a, a, a target market to look at, you know, so we've, we've talked about that a little bit already. Who is my, my, my customer gonna be? Um, we want to look at what area we're going to locate in, and then we have to actually pick the actual site. Where is that actually going to be? And, and what we're thinking while we're doing this is, what's best for the customer? How can they have easy access to what I've, what I've got to offer that they need and that they want? So uh, right location, three-step process. First is a regional analysis, then is a trading area analysis, and finally is the actual site analysis selection. So when we talk about regions, that tends to be something that's a little bit bigger, right? So if we say the Columbus region, it would be Central Ohio or Central Ohio region. And in this case, we're often uh, using things in maybe a country. Uh, so when, when um, uh, say, Walmart wanted to go into Latin America, what was the country they chose? What, what, when they went to the Latin American region, they chose Mexico was the country they chose. That was the region within the region, the country within the region they finally selected. Uh, drilling down a little bit uh, deeper, then we would have the city. Where in, where in the central Ohio area are we going to build our, our, um, our new building? And it might be in Columbus, it might be in Worthington, etc. And then we have things that are called designated market areas or metropolitan statistical areas. And again, these have their acronyms attached to them, and the book covers about what they are and gives you some examples. So designated market area would be uh, counties that are non-overlapping. So um, uh, you know, would be, you know, uh, say three counties in, in, in the, the tri-state region in um, the New York metropolitan area. Uh, sometimes these things, when they're calculated or when, they, when they're promulgated, they change slightly. Um, and a, a lot of time it's based on television viewing habits. In fact, that, that was where it started. And it usually is named after the city that defines itself. Metropolitan statistical area, slightly different, is a area within the U.S. that has at least one urbanized area with a population of at least 50,000. And then that's uh, reviewed, if, you know, the population goes up or down, changes, uh, that would be reviewed every, every decade or so. And then it would be assigned to a statistical area. So in, in the, the book, it talks about 2003 being the most recent it's been since then, but there was over 370 of them uh, at that time, and eight of them were in Puerto Rico. Uh, that may be changing, maybe less down there with, with what's going on. Um, global expansion. So when we're talking about going into other countries, uh, we're, we're going to want to be thinking in terms of, you know, this target market, is it really going to have enough spending power to buy these things? I mean, there are countries in the world where you could you could go in and you'd say, wow, if the, if the staff is really inexpensive here and people really want what I've got to offer, but they don't have the money to buy it. And there's a reason why the staff is underpaid. So you want to make sure that the targeted market has adequate spending power. And so you want, to, you want to conduct these studies to find out what it's like in these other countries. And you might want to be um, hiring people, actually, or, or at least consultants, to be able to give you country-specific or local expertise. And I, I thought this was funny. This was in the textbook about Walmart expanding globally. And it was, this is in Germany, Grosse Neuer Offering. So a big new offering. And uh, there's, the, there's a Statue of Liberty there and all that. But... Here's the deal. Since the time the book was published, Walmart closed its, its uh, uh, well, actually sold its uh, stores in, um, in Germany because they crashed and burned. They didn't make money. So I have an article here right next to it. World's biggest retailer, Walmart, closes up shop in Germany. So from Deutsche Welle. So there you go. Even the best, even those with the most money, uh, with the most resources can make mistakes. This is not a good fit. Let's talk about trading area analysis. So um, Trading area. This is the second uh, step we were talking about there in the first and second slide. In this case, we're going to be looking at a trading area being something that would be defined as accounting for 50% or more of the retailer sales and our customers. So we want to find about about you know where the center of that an area is of different people that are going to want what we have, and and you know that trading area is going to be up to 50% overall what we're going to sell. Determinants would be if it's a primary or secondary market, if it's a fringe market, tertiary. And um, maybe there'll be some sales from outside the area, which is retailers located as well, a lot of tourist trade. So if you think about Orlando, Florida, they have a lot of tourist trade there, obviously, you got Disney World. 
And um, so it's not just the local people, it's also some transit coming through at different times of the year. Uh, trading error considerations, um, how, how many people are there, how the labor force, if it's available, if it's the right type of labor force, rules, laws, all regulations in that area, schools that you could, you know, have a have a people wanting to move there with their families uh, to work for you, etc. So the, the book covers a number of these things. We're talking about this uh, different kinds of considerations. Let's talk a little bit about uh, geographic information systems or GIS. A geographic information system is used to determine that trading area, and we can you know slice and dice it with other consumer characteristics. But there's a lot of data, geographic data and demographic data that's out there that you can look up in using software in these GIS systems. It's really helpful. And this would be an example of a St. Louis, Missouri area, what it would look like. And I can drill down or go back out and I can see where the, the, the most people are. I can have a heat net maybe with traffic patterns and things like that. So this would be an example of a GIS map. A geolocation is a technology that uses web geography to determine where an online buyer is located. So uh, I'm on my phone and I happen to be in um, in Dusseldorf in Germany, and I want to find um, a, I don't know, grocery store. Uh, if it's if 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 they don't know where I'm located, they may show me grocery stores back in Columbus, Ohio, where, where I live. I want to know where there's a grocery store in Dusseldorf, Germany. So geolocation would be able to enable them to know, oh, this person is on this phone, they're in this place. We need to push the the the, the ads or push the the data to them so that they know where it is that they should be looking for this store. Um, so I think in this case, a lot of time personal information wouldn't be correct, but only city and state, and I'm talking about phone to get a lot more information. Some of other techniques that we would uh, maybe consider would be um, customer spotting, you know, coming in, going out, license plate number collection. I've actually seen that where people will be out there writing out people's license numbers in the parking lot. A zip code analysis, have you ever had that when you are at a store and they say, what's your zip code? That's what they're doing. They're trying to find information, demographic information about you. Um, and they have a number of uh, theoretical uh, models. Uh, they're very interesting. Uh, they work. And they talk about Riley's, Huff's, and the index of retail saturation. Those are the three models. I'm not going to cover them. We don't have enough time. But you might have them in the quiz. So I would, I would know a little bit about each one, strengths, weaknesses, a little bit about what they are designed to do, and that will help you with that. Uh, now let's finally go down to site types. So site types, three actual types. Worst, first would be uh, freestanding. So this would be an isolated store in an isolated location, maybe off a main road or a high or street. And there's very limited competition. That's a positive, but negative is nobody can find it, right? Um, second would be planned. So we get some kind of a balanced tenant mix. Uh, this would be regional centers, community centers, neighborhood centers, have that sort of uh, broken out. You see that in places where you'll have uh, maybe an anchor store and then others um, uh, attached to it, things like that. And then the last one was unplanned. And this would be the central business district, secondary and neighborhood business district, strip shopping districts, et cetera. But it wouldn't be something that's planned. Easton would be planned here in Columbus. Easton would be planned. Polaris would be planned. Short North would, or, or German Village would not be planned. Okay. In fact, German Village is largely freestanding. So. Um, Let's talk a little bit about regional centers. These are a type of plant. So we're talking about five to 15 miles away. So you think it's going to take people, you know, five to 30 minutes to get there. You don't want to be traveling more than that. Usually it's general merchandise. There's a lot of parking. Usually have at least one anchor store. And they, they talk about how much uh, gross leasable area, GLA, there is for, for these regional centers. Community shopping center. Again, this is a type of plant. They're smaller. Uh, you know, maybe a quarter the size. Uh, the anchors tend to be smaller department stores or, or discount stores. Um, and they usually have a number of smaller stores and they tend to have a lot of diversity in the mix. So if you come out to the county I live in, which is out in, in, um, in Licking County, and you go to Newark, there's a mall there, but it's, it's this, this kind of mall. It's not big. It's not a population center right here that really is able to carry a regional one. So it's more like a community. Uh, neighborhood centers, this would be 10 minute radius, smaller stores, usually like a strip mall would be an example of this. And um, the, 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 to be either in a, a straight or a curved line, for whatever reason, that's the way they're set up. And usually there's some kind of strong anchor there. Lifestyle center, so lifestyle center would be something that's uh, like a neighborhood center but plant. 
and um, would cater the needs and the lifestyles of people in that in that area. I've seen these um, on the West Coast where it was, um, you know, stores I didn't know, but I could see what kind of people it would attract when I looked at all of them that are there. And I would say, you know, this is this is definitely California. It was like maybe a surfboard shop or something like that. It was definitely uh, a different type of um, uh, lifestyle that I was observing from the the the, the people that would were the target market drawn in. And a lot of time it's not essential essential items and um, usually the park is right up in front it's not you know a big park line you can park right in front other types outlet centers um they uh, have deep discount and brand name products uh, we have things like cyber malls we can go online or airport malls the dreaded airport mall the most overplaced place on earth um central business districts talks a little bit about advantages and disadvantages and if you think if you're from the columbus area you think about something like the short north. Um, look at the disadvantage number one: inadequate and expensive parking. <laughs> that's it. You know, that, that's all you need to know. Um, maybe a lot of bus people, you know, able to get in and out on public transportation, but it's hard to park there, uh, etc. So that would be an example of central business district. These tend to be a little older. So. Um, secondary business district would be again unplanned, uh, again around major transportation centers, but they're less congestion. Tend to have better service offerings and they tend to also be expensive uh, to rent you know, lease space. Um, neighborhood business districts, convenience is big there, better parking, less congestion, higher prices, but you know, sometimes people are willing for the sake of convenience to pay more for something. Uh, strip shopping, advantages, disadvantages, you know, lower rent, large number of retailers, not a lot of price flexibility. It's hard to get people to come there, so it's cost a lot to advertise, you know, where is this place, et cetera. Um, we talk about traffic at a site, and again, we could be talking about vehicle traffic, or we could be talking about pedestrian traffic. So if you think of um, Easton, there's an awful lot of walking that goes around that the main section of Easton, but the satellite stores around Easton, there's a much less of that, much more vehicle traffic, okay? So those are examples of that. And then also, um, when we talk about just the availability of sites. So when we have the issue of I, this is the exact place I want to be located, this is this is where our store needs to be. Here's a problem: they may not have that site or a site big enough for you to be able to locate there. And what are the conditions for occupation? What are you required as a tenant to do? You know, do you have to lay the the, the flooring down? Does that now become a part of the um, the, the the owners of the, the site rather than yours? You can't take it with you when you leave. Uh, what are the taxes there? What, what, you know, you're now in a different municipality. What are the taxes there? What does it cost to operate there? Um, you know, utilities, employees, etc. What's it going to cost to operate there? Um, and and what about the neighbors? You know, if, if you've got a store that's family friendly and you've got a, a neighborhood store store right next to you that's, you know, not family friendly, so you can leave, I'll leave that to your imagination. Probably wouldn't be a good location for you. So again, we've had a chance to look a little bit about how we figure out where we're going to locate our brick and mortar store in this chapter.